Hey, this is Kirk. And this is Bird. It's the Kirk and Bird Show. We are honored to have uh, <clears throat> a dear friend of mine, Jay Michelle, host of the WNBA podcast, Hoop Love. Hey, uh, Jay Michelle, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited. Yeah, another one of a, a person persons that I really do know, um, but, but I, I'm a big fan. Big fan, not just of what you're doing now, and we'll get into it, but what you were doing in college and what you've done over the years. But but first of all, welcome again, welcome. You have a podcast. No, you, well, it's a podcast audio now, and you've done some uh, video. And you're gonna you'll tell us a little bit more about that, but you're gonna go back and you also have audio, a visual. Absolutely, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I've been on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts going into my second season uh, hosting Hoop Love. And so I'm excited to bring the video component in. So look out for that. Got a YouTube channel. So excited to start popping some content as episodes on the YouTube channel now. Great, yeah. great. So, so let's, let's, let's start out. Let's tell us a little bit about uh, this. This is our first episode. We're actually covering the WNBA. Tell us about the WNBA this season. I know this, it just kicked off. You, you had an episode on the draft. You can quickly maybe talk about the draft, any things at high level, and then the season now. Absolutely. Well, again, everybody, thank you so much, uh, Kirk and Bird, for having me on. I'm Jessica, a.k.a. J. Michelle, the host, voice, and creator of the Hoop Love Basketball Podcast, where I talk all things WNBA. And the WNBA season is always an exciting time for me. Um, I tipped the season off this year going into the second season of Hoop Love. And, you know, I covered the draft, kind of did some predictions on Instagram of who I thought would be the top picks. Um, the Washington Mystics, they had the number one pick. And I just knew for a fact they were going to pick Melissa Smith from Baylor University. But they threw us a absolute curveball. And about 72 hours before the draft, they traded away their number one pick to the Atlanta dream. And now what we thought was locked and loaded picks was now up in the air. So that was really exciting to follow. Um, and the top three picks, um, the WNBA draft were really none of the top three picking teams could go wrong with any of those selections. So that was definitely exciting. And now as the first, goodness, two, three weeks now of this uh, 2022 WNBA season has really been exciting. And I really think that as the early going of the season is playing out so far, the top three teams got exactly who they needed in the picks that they made. And all three young ladies, Shakira Austin, went three to the Washington Mystics. Um, and Alyssa Smith was number two to the Indiana Fever. And Ryan Howard, of course, was the number one pick to the Atlanta Dream. But she is really showing out so far, Ryan Howard, down there in Atlanta. So it's definitely been exciting. And uh, lots more to come this season. There's so much going on with the WNBA right now. Headlines are flying around. I know we'll get into that in a little bit, but it's definitely been an exciting start to this new season. Yeah, I, I'm a big us, with us being here, and I'll let Kirk go. But I just, we are big Mystics fans. Like I, re, I was so excited when we got a team. When when the, first of all, when the WNBA started, but having a team we could call our own, and then we'll definitely go back and talk a little bit about our championship, which was which was awesome uh, a few years ago. But 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 Kirk, you can go ahead. I just. I, we're in the D.C. area, for those that don't know, and, and we are big Mystics fans. Yeah. Well, um, Michelle, I would I would ask you, you know, what's your overall prognostication on the season <laughs> that, you know, who you think either is going to win it all or the top two or three teams that can win it in the league and maybe follow that up with um, – you know, some exciting players, not only with the Mystics, but um, some of the exciting players that are that have come into the league and, um, you know, some of the classic Diana Taurasi, uh, who's, uh, you know, getting a little older. But, uh, you know, for the WNBA, what's it what's it looking like? You know, it's the beginning of the season, but is this is this a year where we it's there's a clear cut team to be? One thing that I will say, guys, that it something that really excites me is that I think that it's probably the championship could go any of five ways, in my opinion, this year, which for me as a fan is exciting because I think it's great that there might be a clear, you know, standout team that you think, man, they're a shoe in to win it this year. But the fact that to me, there's about five or six teams that could really come out of nowhere and win it, or there could be a clear 
you know, team that people think can really win it. Now, me, I'm a lifetime Mystics fan, you know, born and raised here in the DMV area. Love the Mystics through and through. We got a championship in 2019. Um, you can't see it now, but the banner is hanging on the wall behind me. And I am so excited. Um, I actually splurged and treated myself during the pandemic and became a Mystic season ticket holder this year. Oh. Um, and so it's so, so exciting. But what I will say is this, guys, that, yeah, I'm a little bit biased to my local, you know, beloved D.C. Mystics. But I think that we're really on the track to really, really make some serious noise. Um, not only this season, but going deep into the playoffs. I think that going out to the West for a second, that the Las Vegas Aces are another team that are certainly poised to really, really make a run. You know, they came up short in this uh, season in 2020 when they played down in the bubble. They made a heck of a run in the playoffs deep into the postseason. They, you know, Asia Wilson is the league MVP that year, and they end up getting swept by Seattle, right, in that final series. And so they ended up losing. They go out last year, and I think now they bring in WNBA legend Becky Hammond as their head coach. They're returning a lot of the core of their team. And also they've added a few other pieces as well. They got, you know, Kelsey Plum back on the squad with them. She came back from injury last season. Chelsea Gray as their point guard really leading them well. And, of course, Asia Wilson is having – a tremendous season so far here in the early going. And I think that it's certainly argument to be made that the Las Vegas Aces are a, quote, sure team to make it to the finals, if not take the title. And then we got to talk about the Seattle Storm, right? They've won multiple championships. Yeah. This is, well, my, my, I personally hope this will be Sue Bird's last season, but I'll save those comments for now. Um, but, you know, she's you know, late into her career now. She's got several gold medals, several WNBA championships, all-stars, MVPs, all this stuff. Seattle has really stacked their team. They've been that way for several years, right? And their new head coach, Noelle Quinn, in her second season. But this is the first full season that she'll be their head coach. I think the Seattle Storm make a run as well. And the final team that I'll speak about here is the Connecticut Sun. They, again, were another squad that has been stacked for the last three, four seasons and just keep coming up short. Last year, they fell in the semifinals to Chicago, who were the eventual WNBA champions last year. But unfortunately, Jasmine Thomas has just gone down with a season-ending uh, injury. She tore her ACL. Mm. So it's questionable, like, oh, what is that going to do? for the Connecticut Sun, and I love watching her growing up in the DMV. Oh, she, she's, she's a, from here. Absolutely. She's an Oakland High School uh, product, standout. Oh. If I may say, Oakland High School legend, played down yes. in uh, Durham, North Carolina at Duke University. Actually spent some time here in D.C. as a mystic, and then she's been probably for about, whew, the last seven, eight years. She's been up in Connecticut, and so really a staple of that team, brings a lot of energy. But even with the absence of Jasmine Thomas, I think that the Connecticut Sun, again, returning the league, you know, they had, they swept the postseason honors last year, right? Their head coach, Kurt Miller, he was the coach of the year. John Quell Jones was the MVP. Um, and what's the young lady? Stephanie Jones, she was the most improved. They're bringing that same team back. And they are certainly, to me, the, quote, most hungry in the league as far as they're right on the cusp of getting it done as far as winning a championship and they just keep coming up short. So it's exciting for me as a fan that, that really to me can go any, um, you know, it can go among many different ways. And we can't forget about the Chicago sky, right? There are the reigning MV, uh, the reigning WNBA champions last year. Will they come back and do it again? They just had their ring ceremony a couple of nights ago. They are making a strong run as well. So it's going to be interesting. All right. So we got you on record for that. It's going to be one of those five, right? Yes, yes. One of, preferably the Mystics, but I think, yeah, one of those five. <laughs> and for our local people, you went to ODU. I did. And you announced men's and women's basketball games there. Right, Michelle? Absolutely. And yeah, today. A really, really good experience. Um, You know, we have a campus radio station, WODU, and so that was something I was really looking at as I – you know, surveyed the landscape of what college I would find, you know, to be my home for the four years of uh, my undergraduate studies. And I was, you know, heavily involved with WODU on campus, hosted a couple of radio shows that I created and host and co-hosted, and then got the opportunity. Um, we had a WODU sports. So we were the, uh, the student color commentators that I, you know, was doing that for the ODU men's and women's basketball. So that was a really great experience to really, you know, talk about the game that I love 
you know, learn from the local media. And really it was a chance to, you know, rub shoulders with the Hampton Roads, you know, who's who as far as sports broadcasting goes. And so that was a really cool and fun experience. And it really transformed into something that I, you know, was, you know, beyond my wildest dreams. So I really enjoyed that experience down there. We didn't have so a podcast we, yet. We didn't have a podcast yet. So we <laughs> no, but we weren't I part was of the follow- who's who of Hampton Roads. I- I was following you back then, though. You know, I followed you, um, and I was very proud of you. And so I'm glad to see you continuing it. A couple of things I wanted to bring. One, Jasmine Thomas, I refereed a number of her games in high school. Just a tremendous, tremendous uh, athlete, basketball player. And this D.C. Metro, we talked about this with Coach Tamika Dudley. We have some of the best women's college well, basketball players, period. I'm talking like when I've seen at the high school level that were the number one players in the nation. And um, that goes back to Moni Curry. Uh, uh, just, Kara uh, Lawson. Kara Lawson. Yes, yeah, the head coach at Duke. Katis, like I, Katie Smirka Duffy. Um, is it um, Elizabeth Monica Seton, Wright. Michelle, that's a basketball powerhouse. Isn't Elizabeth Seton really, really good? Yeah, Elizabeth Seton is another good one, yes. Yeah. And back yeah, in so, our class, there was uh, – was it Penny? Um, she went to Jeb Stewart, which is now Liberty. She was the number one player in the year in 1980, or number one player in the nation in 1987. I remember her, and um, I feel bad that I forgot her name, her last name. Um, uh, Az, Az, what's the young lady at UConn from? Yeah, from AZ the DC? Fudd. That's uh, Katie Smirk and Duffy's daughter. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, this this area is rich um, with with. Uh, women's uh, basketball it's done just done tremendous but one thing I wanted now I'm I'm very proud of you getting those uh, and I know it's a great feeling to get those those season tickets for the Mystics but come on you got to get some press credentials you got to be up there you gotta, <laughs> you gotta you gotta get some press credentials I'm serious too yeah yeah I'm, I'm, I'm definitely working on that um not only you know as you know hosting the podcast now um I have some connections over at the Mystics, and you're not the first pe- people to tell me that. And so it's definitely on my radar to see if I'm able to get my hands on some credentials because that would really take it to the next level. If, if Kirkenberg can get credentials to the VHSL state championship games, you can do it. Absolutely. We know you can do it. So, <laughs> but, yeah, no. And so uh, one and one last thing about your, your coverage down at ODU. Now, he's not a um, – a broadcaster or, or an announcer, but uh, were you familiar with Larry uh, Rubamba uh, yes. of the Virginia Pilot? Yeah. Yes. Rubamba, Rubamba, yeah. Yep. He's been on our show a couple of times. He's uh, done some articles on my niece, and he's a great guy, just a great guy. Yeah, and that's, and again, you know, to be able to, you know, just be a student, right, and to be able, I mean, we're in the media room with all the local media, and that's one thing, and I know that ODU is not the only school that does this, but um, I was excited that it wasn't like, oh, you guys are just students, you know, go over there and just kind of look from afar. But, you know, we're in the media room with the guys who were talking sports on the news, right, writing in the Virginian pilot and all the other local media. So that was really a special experience for me. Oh, great. Oh, great. I know a guy that was um, the sports editor for the Collegiate Times at Virginia Tech. He went on the football plane and the basketball plane. He went with them. That was part of what you got when you – with that position. So yeah, he's a guy cool. we might should have on. Yeah. So that's, that's great. I wanted to ask you your thoughts on Marianne Stanley, the former ODU coach got let go today uh, by Indiana and yeah. um, you, know, you know, they've got an exciting player there. So that was a little bit of, did you see that coming or. To be honest with you, I did not. I felt like if Indiana did not release her at the end of last season, Right. They brought I mean, they had a pretty, you know, they they really struggled, you know, the last few seasons, really just trying to figure out, you know, the mix of players, you know, the the game plans, the schemes that they're going to run to really, you know, play off of the talent that they have. But they just couldn't seem to get it together. And so for me, the beginning of the, you know, the offseason took place. They didn't make any changes. Right. They positioned themselves well for this draft and they had like four or five picks in the first round. And Mary Ann Stanley remained as the head coach. And so to me, I felt like they didn't release her at the end of last season. They're probably going to try to give it one more go to see that, you know, they're adding all this youth and those multiple draft picks that they made in this year's draft. And for them to let her go at this very early stage of the season, that yeah. completely shocked me because I'm thinking, 
you're trying to build something here. And now three weeks into the season, the head coach is fired. And now they have this interim coach. I can't recall his name at the moment, but it just seems like odd timing to me as the team is already trying to overcome so much, right? They bring Lynn Dunn, their former head coach who won championships with that, with that franchise. Now she's in the front office and I'm thinking, okay, they're really going to make a run at this. And so I think it's quite odd timing to release the head coach now, just a few short weeks into this new season. Right. Hmm. Who was um, the women's coach at ODU when you were there? So we had um, Karen Barefoot. She was the coach. Hmm. And my senior year was her last season um, in 2015. She moved on to, I believe, UNC Wilmington after Old Dominion. And I'm in Wilmington, have... North Carolina, right now. Oh man! Yes, <laughs> I talked to yes. Karen last. I talked to Karen last night. Uh, my hotel room is on the Cape Fear River, but um, yeah. So she's not with UNC Wilmington anymore. But I just called her to see if she was here. She was at a cornhole tournament. So I, I thought that was probably the case of her being a coach. Absolutely. We, we need yeah. to get her on, Rusty. She, she's a ball yeah. of energy. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that would be she awesome was... for you guys to get her. Yeah. She's uh she's our age group and she and um she uh played high school basketball uh, at Minchville was she at Minchville Minchville she Kirk? was ninety she was class of nineteen ninety oh so she was ninety yeah but she but went to Christopher uh, and then Newport she, and she played at Christopher Newport yep and started yeah. the women's program at the apprentice school in Newport News mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah yeah that's right yeah so, we had coach Karen Barefoot and I know now they've got um you know former WNBA player Delisha Milton Jones but yeah Karen Barefoot she was there. Um, during my time at ODU. Great coach, great coach. Oh, yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the, the the Mystics and their championship run in 2019. Um, I, you know, I was really excited for it, but, you know, I, let me ask you. So tell us a little bit about that season. And then just overall, what I've seemed to notice is a lot – is there a true dynasty in the WNBA? It's been around now for what twenty seven years. The league. Uh, this this is the twenty sixth season. Last year the they celebrated twenty five or twenty six. Twenty five was last year, right? Right. And is there a Lakers or Boston Celtics of this league? I, I've seen teams now, you know, win and then like like the Mystics kind of just disappear. But then a I thought, which was a, the original power, the Houston Comet, they just, the league, they kind of folded up. So tell us a little bit about, and inform our, our viewers uh, about the, 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 the powerhouse uh, programs. Uh, organizations. So one thing, as, as you just said, I think to me, right, the original was the Houston Comets, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, for them to come into the league and get four back-to-back -back championships, and I don't yeah. know the details of what happened kind of with that franchise because I was much younger then, but they just kind of fizzled out, right? And I don't know if there's been a, quote, dynasty like the Houston Comets since. What I will say in my earlier days of watching the WNBA, I think that the Detroit Shock, um, as coached by uh, Bill Lambeer from the Pistons, yeah. he, yeah, I, I thought, yeah. started to bring that kind of dynasty back with that Detroit Shock team. They won a couple of championships. They had Cheryl Ford, Deanna Nolan, and so many others. And since them, it kind of faded out. If I look to what's happening now, I would say if I had to call one of the 12 franchises a, quote, dynasty, I would have to give it to the Seattle Storm. Um, they Seattle won Storm, multiple yeah, championships. Yeah. And I think for them, their powerhouse play has been the most consistent in the league. You know, as you just mentioned right a minute ago, right, the Mystics, they were, you know, they've been fairly decent over the years. They've had some kind of ups and downs. You know, Coach Mike Tebow has coached them up to the level now where they're, you know, the, the 2019 league champions. And I would also say outside of the Seattle Storm, you know, like the Phoenix Mercury, right, they've gone on some runs. And but I think overall there isn't a main you know, dominant team that I can point to other than the Seattle Storm as far as consistently dominating their way through the league. And I think on the newer side of things, the Las Vegas Aces, they're starting Aces to kind of build up to that level. For them, though, the missing piece is a championship to really stamp, you know, the run that they've gone on over the past couple of seasons. Right. Is Las Vegas, were they an expansion or did they just move from another city? They actually moved. So they were um, the San Antonio Silver Stars. 
and then they okay. moved out to Las Vegas about four or five years ago. Las Vegas is becoming a sports town. Yeah, it is. And, and their owner, Mark Davis, has really, in my opinion, led the league as far as investing in women. You know, he's br he's brought in, uh, you know, WNBA legend Becky Hammond now as the coach. And she's allegedly making a million dollars. Right. And wow. they're really in he's really investing in the team, right, their facilities and all these things. And I think that he's really, in my opinion, leading the charge as far as investing in women so that the Las Vegas team, anyway, that he's the owner of, can have staying power in the league. Right. So, Michelle, I'd mentioned this. I was talking to a friend earlier, and I told him we were doing a podcast and we were going to concentrate on the WNBA tonight. And um, so very recently, U.S. soccer announced that there was going to be compensation parity between women's soccer and men's soccer. So then I, I started thinking about compensation parity. So there's the WNBA and there's the NBA and then there's other areas of sports. Um, you're on top of the NBA. I mean, and um, we're men, you know, we're in our club and women are in their club. What, 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 are, what are your feelings on the pay equity? Like soccer is different, but with the WNBA, I mean, what are your feelings on that? Well, I would say this, guys, that I don't know that the WNBA is necessarily going to have complete uh, equity in terms of comparing it to the NBA, right? I don't know that we're going to get to a place as much as I would love to see it as a woman and as a sports fan. I would love to be able to see, you know, the players in the WNBA making multi, you know, signing multi-million dollar contracts. But unfortunately, that's not where we are. But I do think that the pay in the WNBA has to be increased. And there's a number of factors, right, that contribute to that mm -hmm. as far as, you know, like the price of a WNBA ticket I'm like, how is this league going to be sustained if a game ticket for, you know, you know, right near the bench is $50, right? And then you you take that and you have to think about, okay, well, the ticket prices, you know, what, how much money is being made at the arenas, right? Concessions, merchandise, all that stuff, you know, right. the season ticket holders and many other things, right, go into that as far as, you know, hey, what – contracts is the league signing right as far as sponsorships mm -hmm. televised games yeah. nationally televised games all that stuff and the WNBA in my opinion is certainly moving in the right direction as far as putting the games out there on platforms that are accessible to a wide variety of people but you know I would love to see the WNBA players making more money I mean a rookie contract in the WNBA is like an entry-level corporate job Right. So you really have to make the choice between so, am I going to go with my major and pursue a corporate career or am I going to go into the WNBA and perhaps have to play overseas or get sponsorships or do additional right. things off the court to really make up that revenue. And like the soccer players, I would love to see, you know, the equity get closer and closer to being, you know, equally paid and yeah. what it should be. But it's definitely a tough road. I think the WNBA is making good steps in the right direction, but it's a long road ahead, certainly. So one of the things, I, uh, and I'm, um, I had this discussion with a friend of mine about a week or two ago, whenever um, the announcement was made regarding soccer and, and, and their equity um, and what they've been fighting for for years. Um, but one of the things I kind of thought we, he, what we talked about, and he has a daughter who was an athlete um, in, in high school, but we, he said, you know, I don't want to sound sexy, and, and, and this is DW. DW is a big fan of our show, but we were talking about it, and um, he said, but, but I don't, I don't want to sound sexy, but the WNBA shouldn't make it. It shouldn't be parity if they're not bringing in the same revenue. And, and, and what he was saying is, you can't compare the NBA contracts and all that if the, if they aren't the same crowds, if they're not charging the same ticket, if they're not getting the same um, promotion and advertising and you know sponsors. Um, so that that does need to increase. But is the league still kind of being subsidized by the NBA? And then the other question I would have for you is: I haven't been to a game in years. What are the stands? Now, one thing I think was a good move, the Mystics moved into their own arena, which is a little smaller, which I think is huge, makes a big deal. But what are those crowds like? So I love what you just brought out there with the arena that they're playing in. So they were in Capital One Arena, 
And it really used to make me sad because I'm like, you know, I go to Wizards games all the time, you know, growing up. And that arena is packed, right? Sold out every night. Fans come from everywhere. And it's just a totally different experience. Now, when you go back to Capital One Arena for the Mystics games, it looks like it's 20 people there. Now, that's not that's not the actual number, but I think that large arena makes a small crowd yeah. look very small. And so now yeah. when they've made the transition about three or four years ago to their own arena, the entertainment and sports arena, now I feel that they're getting a full building that's loud, that's cheering for them and that's supporting and it really gives them the energy that they need and that they want to have, right, as players. And so I think for me, the Mystics have done a good job of creating a game day experience. And so you're Absolutely. at a place that's specifically for the Mystics and they're not the only ones, right? That footprint is being followed around the league. I know the Atlanta Dream now play at the Gateway Center that's specifically for them and kind of, you know, other local entertainment events from, you know, mm -hmm. local sports to concerts and whatnot. But I think that that footprint really gives the ladies a special environment for them. And it really creates a good, exciting and fun game day experience for the fans. So, so two things to go along with that. I absolutely agree. Because, it, it, you know, I'll give you an example from, from when I was in college. I'm in a, a fraternity and we threw uh, parties. And one of the things we would say is like, okay, we're going to have a party at, this, at the gym or this place. And to me, it, the, the, the thing that really makes a party is, you know, kind of the atmosphere. And so I would rather have a party in somebody's house and it be packed, and then be in a big gym or auditorium, and and you could still have you could have five hundred people there. But if it feels like it's too spread out, whereas if I if I fit two hundred people into a much smaller venue and in some type of auditorium on campus, it just felt better. It felt like you know like because we're, we're wall to wall. You 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 just we knew that, and so we always had to consider what was our crowd and audience and it couldn't be about let's get this bigger venue we can make more money we you can build on it if it feel if the environment is, is jamming and banging so that's one thing so i think that it, and, and that was one of the models that vcu used um in when we built our own arena now we used to play at the richmond uh coliseum and i think that can hold up to like twelve thousand, and that was our home arena for years but when they built the on campus facility the Siegel Center it um it holds about seven some up close to eight thousand and people are always like we should have built it bigger but you know what we've been selling out I think we we had, due to the pandemic we had you know we had that, that broke up but you know from our final four run in 2011 until now we 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 had we were sold out for every game the place was packed and it was definitely an atmosphere Right. And so I'd rather have eight, seven, eight thousand crazies like Duke than and have a, a fifteen thousand seat arena, and you still have eight thousand, but it doesn't feel the same. Right? Have you been to Cameron Indoor? Have you been in the building? Oh yeah, yeah. It's really small. TV makes it look a lot. It better. makes it look a lot bigger. You're right. Yeah. But again, going it's back to just the feeling of the building is packed. Like I was just at the Mystics game last weekend. And not every seat was full, but it was a very full arena that afternoon. And everybody's cheering. It really just gives them that atmosphere that I think that they really deserve. And I think following that footprint around the country with the different teams, right, attendance is up, you know, women's basketball coming off of strong college seasons with the NCAA, yeah. players getting drafted into the WNBA. And now everybody's, oh, I got to go to the game to see, you know, such and such player. And so – having those facilities that are specific to the ladies, everybody's coming, it's full, not everybody, but a lot of people are coming and it's full and yeah. it really creates that fun, upbeat, high energy atmosphere. When, and when you, you can, when you, as long as, you, oh, I'm sorry, just, as long as you were, you were at ODU, they, they didn't play at the scope anymore. Cause when I was in, we were in school, they played at the scope, which you guys play at the, the Ted. No, yeah, it was, that. Back oh, then man. it was the Ted Constant Center. Now it's Chartway Ted. Arena. Yeah. Yeah, Chartway that, that was right. built. But your whole time, when was that built? That was built in the 2000s. Okay, yeah. all right, yeah. We opened, our, ours opened in uh, two, 99 or 2000. It's been a little over 20 years, but okay. All right, but uh, same, same, same philosophy applies, you know. But getting back to, I, I looked up, 
and you'll know this more, but it was like Diana Taurasi and two or three other women. Top salary was two hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars, and based on what you told me, that sounds about right. Um, which to me seems extremely low. And um, but also, when you think about you know money's green, and you know that's the big color, um, and you know to pay athletes, and we're not talking about. You know, if a man runs Goldman Sachs and a woman runs Goldman Sachs, they're doing the same job. This is about you're selling. You got to fill the seats, concessions, parking, the television revenue, and all that. And it's interesting because um, if you think about the World Cup, women's soccer, this country gets gets crazy about the World Cup, and uh, I think. Basketball is moving in the right direction. I think certainly UVA, Philadelphia, UVA, and South Carolina's Don Staley, that incredible contract, I think it's like almost $3 million a year, mm -hmm. is a good signal. But to get up there and have some of that parity and for, for women to make more money, I think it goes right in line with what you're talking about. And it's that atmosphere because that atmosphere can also be seen on television. Right. The Celtics game the other night. That is a crazy atmosphere. I went to see the Heat play uh, Philadelphia a couple weeks ago in Miami. Man, wi uh, Wizards games are yawners compared to Miami. The place is jumping. Uh, you know, lots of Latino music and dancing and those types well, of things. Well, Miami fans are are, are, are are bandwagoners. So if they're not having, they're, you know, they're like teams in L.A. and play. Like If they're not winning, they're not there because they don't have to go to the beach or whatever. But so, yeah, ask, ask the baseball team in Miami about about fan support. Yeah. Well, OK, anyway, that's another, another I, topic. I, I, but, you know, to point. that point, though, yeah. I think as far as the fan experience or the fans wanting to come and support, it has to do with the product that you put on the court. Right. Absolutely. And so I think yeah. that I for me personally, having grown up going to Mystics games when the years that we were struggling, the seats were empty. Now that we've won the championship, the team is good, people are healthy, they're back. Everybody wants to flood that arena to see them play. And so I think that goes back to getting exposure on TV. I think, again, the WNBA, their leadership is headed in the right direction as far as getting more mm -hmm. games nationally televised to make it easier and more accessible for fans or people that are interested and want to check it out to be able to watch, right? Now, what they also are doing now is putting games like on Facebook and Twitter which I, I don't necessarily yeah. like, but at the same time, it gives more exposure to people. If you're going through social media, oh, what is this Mystics versus the Mercury? And they click on it and they're watching and now they may like it. So I think they're starting to get more innovative with making the games accessible and you're going to attract more fans. And I think that just going back to our topic here is the pay. More people liking, more people following, more people coming to the games, buying tickets and merchandise, jerseys, et cetera. Now the players are going to be able to increase their salaries because more money is coming in. And you were asking earlier about, you know, the WNBA. They still are subsidized by the NBA, which I think a part of them really making their own identity. Not that they're going to tear apart fully from the NBA, but I think that they have to really start standing on their own two feet. And, I mean, I know they just got like a $75 million um, endowment in the offseason. And they've got plans for that money. So they're definitely getting attention. It's just really investing that back into the players and exposure more and more for the league as a whole. Yeah, you know, I mean, and I think it's ridiculously low for for, for, for their better players to be making, you know, two, three hundred, whatever it is, two hundred thousand. But I will say this, um, they, they only play about a 32 game season. Uh, as opposed to an 82, um, like the NBA. And they, they do have that opportunity to go and play another season someplace else. Uh, that, not that that's right, but but I, I, that's one thing that you can kind of factor. I, I think it's ridiculously low. When I look at, you have guys, what, what is the, the, um, the Miami Heat player, the, the uh, shooter got a, a five-year, $90 million contract, and he doesn't even start getting that much playing time time now um what is his name not not Matt Struess but but the other guy but anyway my point is 90 million dollars for a guy who can't even start now doesn't get a lot of playing time and you're talking about a 75 million dollar endowment like not, they just gave one dude for five years 90 like I, I'm thinking 
why can't they get a seven hundred and fifty million dollar endowment? You, you know, I mean, right. I, I just think more can be done. Right, and that goes along with, like Michelle said, it's it's the popularity, and it's um, you know we're never going to forget the soccer, the World Cup, Mia Hamm, um, and uh, you know, the. That World Ch- Cup Randy team. Chastain. Randy yeah. Chastain. I ran into them at Dulles Airport one time, by the way. Uh, the whole team. They're, they're brands. You know, they're brands forever. They're going to be able to sell product and, and all that type of thing. And I think as time goes on, it'll get that way. And I, I'll close with this, with, with the uh, the pay equity. When I really brainstormed and I thought about it, I'm like, women's tennis, to me, is the one that's probably closest. Um. Now, their gap's not that big, but I can tell you that when Serena and um, Venus came in and there was uh, Rafa and um, Roger Federer were just coming, they were very close. If you ever watch, you know, the Wimbledon U.S. Open, the women's draw, especially when American players are good, is very popular. So I think... Mm -hmm. But, you know, tennis has been around for a very, very long time, and it's had some real trendsetters. So um, why don't we do this? Why don't you tell everybody where they can find your podcast? So uh, we'll put it on the screen for a good couple of minutes, and if folks want to jot it down, uh, we'll overlay it for you. Absolutely. So again, it's the uh, Hoop Love podcast where I talk all things WNBA. You can listen to the episodes you can find me if you just search Hoop Love on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. You can also follow me on Instagram underscore Hoop Love VA, and you can get connected with me that way. And I'm gonna um, I'll also have a YouTube channel, so I'm gonna have some videos and some other cool, fun content coming up there as well. So check me out. So, so Hope J Michelle. So now we 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 we're here. You're doing this. You got. How did you? get this love for basketball. Let's go back. I know a little bit about your history. You, you were a baller in high school. I, I checked you out. You got mad game. So tell us, though, how that started. How, did you play other sports? How did you get into basketball? Sure. So I actually started my athletic journey as a soccer player. Um, I played soccer at my elementary school. I started in first grade and really loved it. You know, played mid- midfield, and then I eventually transitioned to play defense in the last couple of seasons that I played. And I was, you know, literally at daycare with some friends. We're just shooting around playing basketball. And one of the teachers was like, yo, you're kind of good. And so my dad came to pick me up. And he was like, hey, you know, you should probably get her, you know, into basketball. You know, I've been seeing her. And so we ended up moving from Manassas out to Loudoun County in probably about fourth and fifth grade. I played on my first team. And as soon as I stepped on the basketball court, I said, yeah, I think I'm done with soccer. This is my true love right here. And I've been playing basketball ever since. Um, you know, I played at a high level high school, did the whole AAU circuit, um, played for the um, Notre Dame Academy uh, Dragons back in 2000. Goodness gracious, I'm going to date myself. 2007, I was a freshman and uh, we played, we were the number one team in uh, high school girls basketball. And it was such a That's tremendous right. opportunity. Um, and I was just a freshman, you know, among a team of, you know, seven, eight girls on the team were all, you know, D1 scholarship commits to play D1 basketball. And for me, it was a time to really kind of sit back and be a sponge to watch them to learn and to really grow and get ready because it's like, hey, your time is coming, you know, once they all graduate. And so um, that's a little bit of how I kind of got my start. And I always thought that I would, you know, play basketball. We're sitting here talking about the WNBA. I figured, hey, I'll probably play in college. And if I get drafted to play in the WNBA, you know, that would be my path. Um, But towards the end of high school, I just felt the draw like, you know, hey, I've been totally consumed by basketball since the very early years of my life. And I just really kind of wanted to do something different. You know, I was always a kid, you know, the teachers writing notes home. Hey, she's always talking in class. You know, we love her energy, but, you know, (laughs) she's kind of distracting people and distracting, you know, me as the teacher. And so really kind of that love for, you know, talking and public speaking and my love for basketball led me into the kind of radio sports broadcasting field. And I actually work professionally um, nine to five. I do marketing work. Um, I've been at my current company for about four years now and really just, you know, Hoop Love is a fun outlet to, you know, combine my love of sports and, you know, sports broadcasting. And, hey, I tell people I'm just a super fan with a microphone. So it's definitely been 
um, a fun journey. I mean, I played a variety of sports from lacrosse to volleyball, you know, soccer, basketball. I did quite a bit growing up. Michelle, I can tell you right now, and I don't blow smoke. I, I, I keep it real, speak the truth. You are better than a lot of people on television that we're seeing, you know, uh, first um, pass, all these programs. There are, you know, a lot of people on big platforms that are not that good. There are a lot of people doing podcasts. But the good news is, is there's a high demand. Sports are going up and up and up. So, I mean, I, I hope everybody will check it out and some exposure for, you know, uh, a sport that does not, that needs more. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, I certainly mm -hmm. appreciate that. And that was really, yeah, and, you know, my heart behind it is, you know, the yeah. WNBA, you know, I'm certainly passionate about it. And I've been a longtime fan, you know, growing up and now a young adult. But, you know, women's basketball, as far as college is concerned, is growing in popularity. Oh, the yeah. WNBA is kind of like, you know, that quiet mouse in the corner. So I'm like, I want to kind of amplify it. And, you know, I talk about it. So I definitely appreciate the support. And you guys have me on. And I certainly appreciate your kind uh, comments there. So we're going we're gonna to wrap this up in a second. But let's, let, let's try to see if we can find a little bit more interesting things about you, uh, Jay Michelle. Tell, okay. So do you have a favorite movie? And, and, or, and if you do, is it? Is it is it related to sports? Do you have a favorite sports movie? We haven't seen a lot of women in basketball movies, but we there are a few, you know. There are, but and it may not even be that. But what what, is, what what do you have a favorite go to favorite movie? Every time you click on the TV, if, if you turn on TV and it's on, you're gonna stop. Absolutely. So this is actually kind of tough because my un my undoubtable favorite movie is Love and Basketball. That's um, I, think it has been for so I didn't want to say it. Yes, it has been for so yeah. long. And, you know, another one of my favorites that's a close second to love in basketball is Brown Sugar. And during mm -hmm. the pandemic, I watched Brown Sugar so many times. And I'm like, you know, this is a close. Uh, now it's more like a tie instead of one and two. But um, okay. I think between those two movies, I really, I, I'm a huge Sonal Lathan fan. You know, she just yeah. happens to be in both movies. Um, and so I think mm -hmm. love and basketball, I, I just love rom-coms. I love basketball. So love and basketball kind of, great, you know, it's like, oh, it's the fusion of the two. Um, and I like mm -hmm. Brown Sugar as well. I love music. I love hip hop. And, you know, it kind of talks about that. It's a love story. Um, so, yeah, those are my two favorites. Okay. What about um, regular content? TV, are you streaming television? anything now? Are you streaming? Because younger folks tend to, you know, they get, they ingest their entertainment from streaming. I mean, there's people that only have Netflix. There's people that only have YouTube. That's it. That's all they have. Yeah, that's it. And I would tell you guys this. I mean, the streaming culture has really spoiled me because I'm to the point now where, you know, a couple of shows that I'm watching now, some sports related, some aren't, you know, like All American, um, the football show. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, I like Bling Empire on Netflix. I like uh, Nailed It on Netflix. But it's really gotten me because, like, for me personally, gone are the days where I'm like, oh, the Equalizer, I mean, the Equalizer on CBS, that's probably the only show that I watch, you know, week to week when it airs every Sunday night. But other shows, you know, the streaming culture has really kind of messed me up because I'm like, I will literally – wait until the show is over on TV in real time yep. <laughs> to yeah. be able to sit down and watch. You know, there are some shows that I will literally watch all night long and boom, I just finished the season. But really for <laughs> me, it's just the convenience of having the option to, whenever I want to sit down and watch something, I can watch as many episodes as I want and not have to wait until, oh, it doesn't come back on until next week. So I will literally wait yep. until the season is over and I'll go on Hulu or Netflix or wherever it is, and I'll just watch it as, at my leisure. Right. That, that's so me. you you said a key word, and that's hip-hop. My favorite music genre by far is hip-hop. Second would be rock. But Rusty and I have the advantage of being 53 years old. And when Rick Rubin and Russell Simmons were in the NYU uh, dorm room, forming Run DMC, finding LL Cool J, uh, you know, finding the Beastie Boys, that was our time. So with our age difference, why don't you tell us about what you like, who you like in hip hop? Because I got some questions about, I'm trying to open my mind, Rusty, because you always like, you'll only do old school. 
I'm starting I'm only- to hold my mind. So what, what, what do you think, Michelle, about what hip hop are you into being at your age? So the current hip hop, I'm going to be honest, not that it's bad, but to me, it's not really the same. Um, mm-hmm. And so I like, you know, J. Cole, Kendrick Lamar. Those are the kind of people that I like. If you ask me who the rappers are today, I probably can't tell you because I'm not listening to them. Um, the only one I probably really know is the baby because he's his name is everywhere. But yeah. you know, like I said, J. Cole, um, I like I mean, Big Sean really isn't so much hip hop. He's not really a rapper. But, you know, J. Cole, Kendrick Lamar, those are the type of guys that I like as far as the quote newer school uh, hip hop artists. That's funny because there's a guy my age um, and he's like loves Kendrick Lamar because other guys my age, Rusty, our age said Chance the Rapper. I listen to Chance the Rapper and I'm like, no, 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 no it's not yeah. good. Yeah, how about that feeling. kid? How about the kid Logic from Montgomery no, that's County? That's another one. That's another one that I like because I good. think for me, I listen to the lyrical content. More so than just, oh, the beat is catchy, right? Now, there are some songs, oh, yeah. I don't lie, that I have no idea what they're saying. I just like the beat in this the entertainment. Beat, yeah. and I like the groove of it. But, you know, right. for me, I think Logic, he's another one. that He's got the flow. He's got the sound. I like him as well. He's very good. Have you heard of Logic, yeah. Rusty? No. You got to check Dude, him out. He, he's like okay. a 20, 21-year-old white kid, real small, grew up in a rough part of Montgomery County. And he is so good, I'll man. Check him out. He's got a lot of followers, yeah. So I okay. mean, I, I, there's a documentary on him on uh, I believe it's Netflix. So, um, but uh, so yeah, we want people to tune into your show, and um, what we what we would like to do is do a check in. You know, let's do a check in like mid season, see where things are. You know, we'll talk about the five teams, you know, where they are and um, um, get an update from you. But, uh, Rusty, what else do you want to cover uh, before we close? Uh, just in closing, so this is my little hip-hop thing. So I will say this, old school and gospel. So that's all, you know, I'm listening to. Uh, my son, Justin, thinks he's a rapper. He has a few uh, YouTube videos and songs. Um, but I raised him on old school school and we're trying to teach him that the lyrics mean something like he could you can't learn that and that's i say that because of what you said jay michelle like my son just i'm like you can't learn that from what they're doing i said so we're we're gonna like you know uh we're 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 playing old school and we're like they're telling a story bro like or 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 the lyrics are getting you hyped but they make sense like if, if, if this is a dance or a party jam like but it makes sense, you know, or they're, they're telling about their experiences. Um, and so that, that's, that's, I just try to make, you know, like, what is it? Um, um, MC Ricky B that the, the uh, uh, oh gosh, what is the, um, why I'm so old. What is the, um, the song by Slick Rick, Slick Rick. Um, uh, the show? The, the, the Stuggy Fresh yeah, or Slick no. Rick. No, this when he tells a story about oh, children's you know, story. the whole oh, yeah, children's story. Yep, I can't think I of the actual title. Yeah. Like he's telling a story. Right. And, but my kids have heard that so many when it comes on in the car or well, when we play it, we're all like, yeah. <laughs> you know, so um, so anyway, that that's my last bit on that. But then I just want to close with this. Jay Michelle, all right, you just inherited two billion dollars. What does Jay Michelle do with that money? Whew. Well, my first question is how fast can I spend it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, if I got $2 billion, I would probably do a combination of, you know, some say, you know, some, you know, as far as charity work goes. Um, one thing that I would definitely do without hesitation, I would, you know, give to my church, you know, pay off my parents' mortgage, send them on a nice lavish vacation of their choosing. Uh, buy myself a house, you know, hello, um, uh, you know, take my friends on a trip, and I... If you buy one in Ashburn, you might spend half the two billion. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Purchase that house, and it's like, oh, I got about $15 left. Okay, so, yeah. Right. Um, and then, you know, I would, you know, save a big chunk, and one thing that I would really like to do also is, if I had that two billion, is set up a scholarship at my alma mater, Old Dominion, to, you know, pave the way for, you know, other students coming in. What would you, know you think what, about in, investing in, own, like, ownership uh, 
um, maybe in WNBA or some type of professional. Absolutely. Right? Um, and one thing that I'm really passionate about is, you know, supporting small business. And so I would yeah. um, kind of follow in Serena Williams' uh, footsteps. I know she's got the uh, Serena Ventures, her venture, cap venture capital company. So I would probably try to do something like that as well. You know, pick various small businesses, you know, invest in them and really kind of help give them the support that they need and, you know, that financial backing. And yes, I would start probably a couple of WNBA franchises because we need expansion, expansion, expansion. So yes, I would yeah, use, yeah. and I probably could buy about five WNBA teams. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and you, you could buy could more than five. Kirk and Burr, you could break off Kirk and Burr a little bit. Yeah, actually. exactly. <laughs> you know, Rusty, I think that's the first time we've written that question down. I think that's the first time you actually asked. We've asked it. Yeah. But I knew now that you have, I, I want to ask you, what's your answer? What would you do with $2 billion? Um, I would do a lot of the things that, that Jamie Shell said. I would, you know, take care of uh, family. Uh, now, my parents, are, they do okay. My brother, his wife, they do okay. Um, but I would just do things like, Hey, this is, you know, what do you want? What, what can, well, how can I bless you? I'd make sure my nephews, nieces, cousins could all go to college for free, you know, based on them, that's being what they want to do. And if not, I'll try to support them probably in other ways. Um, and then I think I would um, look at ways to invest. Um, I, I already into real estate. And so I would do that, but I would like two billion is not going to get me a, fr a professional franchise. But if I could use that money, to grow it. And so if I have a goal like, like within five to 10 years to make that 2 billion, 5 billion, then we're talking, I can, I can maybe get into the game, but I would love to, I think be a, a you know, watching um, winning time um, on HBO about the Lakers and Jerry Buss <laughs> and how you started that. It, it's like, yeah, I would love to be able to, you know, we, we all kind of play GM, like when there's a trade here or this or that, but I, I would love to, to, to be able to own a, a professional franchise. And I think um, my wife and I, we talk about, we, I play this game with my kids. Oh, if you got money, what would you do? Or if you open any team. And so I think I would, um, I would do basketball because I could, you know, it could be something I would enjoy uh, inside. Cause my wife was like, Oh, we can do football. And they only got to have like 10 home games. <laughs> but, but I think I would do basketball and I would try to probably have an NBA and a WNBA franchise in Hampton Roads. There you go. That would be good. Yeah. Yep. What about you, Kurt? You know, it's funny. I, I've, I've thought about it. I would take $150 million for myself, and I would give away $1,850,000. Or I would start a foundation to fund things. But you think about $150 million. In the last 55 years, the market has returned 11%. So the reason why I said 150 is because I'm going to take that 50 million and I'm going to do my things. I would want three or four, maybe three homes. I'd want a, a mountain home. I'd want a beach home and maybe a nice place in a big city. You know, because if you're rich, why not? And oh, by the way, I have to have a plane. So oh, and you, then, you just blew all your money. Get a no, get I did Fifty million dollars. Hold Scotty on. Pitt. Fifty million dollars. Fifty million dollars is plenty because I can't. This excess and building like you know a fifty million or a fifty million dollar house in the Hamptons. No. So the other thing is that um, first of all, least, least I would set. Them. Hold on, I would set people up for life that I love that need it that could handle it. Because a lot of right. times the worst thing that you can do is set somebody up for life for money because you're setting them up for misery. Some people need to be structural and work. But you know, I would you know I would like to have a foundation on the side mm -hmm. and be able to do whatever I want to do. But you know, giving to causes and growing that money and those type of things. And you know, it's there's a lot of things to do. And then you know, a, a sports franchise? No, nah, I wouldn't want to own one. I wouldn't want to own one. I don't think so. I, I, I'd love to be like, you know, huge, uh, you know, I, I would love to give Virginia Tech a huge amount of money, you know, and, but I would say. Uh, now, now what you could do with that money is you could do some, get some business and you can create your own NIL and then 
really helped Virginia Tech. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, I'll definitely do that. Oh, if Texas A&M spent $31 million on NIL, notice how I worded that. Right. I, I might be able to pop the Hokies five, six, seven, eight million dollars a year with a billion dollars. Probably a little more, but that's that's good. Real quick, Rusty, um, and I'll let you take us out. This has been a lot of fun, Michelle. Our show is the Kirk and Bird Show on YouTube. All of our podcast information and our social media is going to appear, and it's going to run probably for the rest of this video. So we love for people to subscribe. It takes two seconds. We understand. You know, a lot of people don't do it. Um, do us a favor. Click the subscribe button. Um, statistically, subscribers view quite a bit longer. So uh, we'd love to have you as a regular viewer. And we understand that when we do a show like this, that's over 50 minutes long, you're not going to ingest it. You're going to watch it in pieces like I do. You know, way to the airport, this, that, the other. That's how I watch podcasts. So why don't you go ahead and take us out, Rusty? This has been a lot of fun, Michelle. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, been a lot yeah. of fun. Thank you guys so much for having me. I've enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. You I, are good. I, I, thank you. I thank feel you. like. And if you now, weren't, I, I wouldn't say it. anything. <laughs> <laughs> No, I feel like now we're legit because we have a professional uh, with, with us. But we're just like, yeah, we're the guy yeah. just talking at whatever. But no, <laughs> uh, 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 Jay, Michelle, I am just so proud of what you're doing. I definitely want to support you in any way that I can and we can. Um, and, and that goes, um, you know, to anything, anything we can do. And, and let me ask you this. Back in the day. Um, we, you know, we, we attended the same church when you were, you were much younger. Um, let me ask, did I ever teach any of your, any Bible studies that you were in or, Absolutely. or that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. you did. Yep. And you, always intelligent, uh, carried yourself. Well. Like you look back and you go, man, like we had a, a great youth ministry at, at, at Mount. I, absolutely. But it, it, it was, it was a combination of, of a great group of kids. We had some some really, I thought, uh, dynamic uh, youth leaders who now, if you look at it, so many have gone on to actually be pastors of churches, lead leaderships in other areas. But you, I, I just want to say I'm very proud of you. And did you ever come to any of your dad's softball games? I did. When yes, I remember yeah. those days. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. He's a baller, man. Yeah, Mike, your dad's great softball player. Yep. <laughs> and you so, know, anyway. he, he, he passed that torch to me. I played on my work team. Um, we're oh, not, we haven't okay. played, of course, during the pandemic. But pandemic, I him, right. Do? He's like, oh, man, you carrying the torch. So, yeah, absolutely. I remember so, those softball days when he played. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to have to hook up with you there because I haven't played since the pandemic, but I'm looking like – for 50 and over league and I, while I'm still in early 50s I'm going to be a man <laughs> <You know? laughs> so there's plenty man that. there's plenty oh I know yeah. I know I was a hot recruit when I was 49 oh all the 50 year and over teams were calling me I <laughs> hey, come. so, so <laughs> maybe I'll find, and, and I can get you pop out there but thanks again you are doing a wonderful job and I just want to uh you know just just uh say that we're very proud of you yeah, uh, yeah. with that yeah, go check out Hoop Love with Jay Michelle. We know there are people out there that are junkies for the WNBA. This young lady is very good, and she's a lot better than those people on the television. And all I'm doing <laughs> is speaking the truth. Yeah, all check right. her out. Yeah, I certainly appreciate right. that. And thank you to you both for, you know, sharing your platform and your show. And, you know, Mr. Russell, you and your wife have really poured into me in my younger days and, Certainly appreciate you know appreciative of this full circle moment. We're sitting here on the podcast together, so thank yeah, you to you both. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. It's been fun. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're right. welcome. You're welcome. And with that, the Kirk and Bird Show is out.